These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythm, just get down. From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University. Welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, a conversation with SNCC activist, Cortland Cox. Africa World Now Project is next. The range and scope and manifestations of the black freedom struggle are varied, yet connected by a common thread. It does not matter where you look. Pick a point on the map of human geography. Pick a geographical landmass or region. The continent of Africa, the Caribbean, or somewhere in the northern part of the Americas, you will find a common thread. And that thread is the radical imagination of young people. You will find a historical path that reaches to the present you will find the beginnings of a road built with the vibrancy of young folk who envisioned a world beyond struggle. We can see the materiality of this fact in the continuum of Africana resistance. In 1937, as a response to a resolution passed at the 1936 National Negro Congress in Chicago, which asserted that it is the duty and right of all Negro youth to fight for the eradication of the evil from which they suffer. And from this, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, SNCC, was created. The high school and college-age young people who attended this first convention of the National Negro Congress wanted to fully participate in the work of the NNC without being hampered by the elders in the organization. In order to divert potential conflicts of interest and the methods used to move towards freedom between youth and elders, the NNC decided that all local youth councils will be responsible only to the national secretary and the national executive board of the NNC. Active in the NNC convention, Edward Strong received the position of national youth chairman. Strong was a youth leader at the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Chicago, and he had organized the first International Negro Youth Conference 1933. As National Youth Chairman, Strong, now in his mid-twenties, led the drive to establish a Southern Negro Youth Congress. On July 23, 1936, he published the call for a Southern Negro Youth Conference and the prospectus of the Southern Negro Youth Conference to be held during the Thanksgiving holidays in November. In the, quote, call, unquote, he reminded youth of the South that 73 years had passed since the days of slavery. Yet blacks still face, quote, clouds of reaction and oppression, end quote. This, quote, common yoke of exploitation, discrimination, and hunger, end quote, he declared required blacks to be, quote, united as one to strike out in a new and mightier drive to the goal we are determined to achieve, freedom, equality, and opportunity, end quote. Thousands of black youth responded to the call for direct action to organize Southern youth for these goals. Assembled in Richmond, Virginia for the first Southern Negro Youth Congress were some 534 delegates representing 250,000 young people in 23 states and an estimate crowd of 2,000 observers. They represented, quote, sharecroppers from Alabama and Mississippi, domestic workers from Georgia, chain gang victims from the now flooded areas of Arkansas and Tennessee, school teachers from Florida, longshoremen, laborers, college students, and every other representative of Southern Negro life, end quote. Strong in his address to the Congress stated that the purpose and objectives of the gathering, and while we have come, we have come first of all seeking the right to creative labor, to be gainfully employed with equal pay, we have met for freedom, equality, and opportunity. At the conference, The youth delegates were divided into commissions or groups to discuss specific problems and to make recommendations to the general body for their approval, modification, and or rejection. Important to note of these recommendations, the youth delegates asserted that Afro-American history should be taught in public.
public schools. The Southern Negro Youth Congress, SNCC, lasted for 12 years, 1937 to 1949. According to Charlie Cobb, young activists and organizers with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee represented a radical, new, unanticipated force whose work continues to have great relevance today. For the first time, young people decisively entered the ranks of civil rights movement leadership. They committed themselves to full-time organizing from the bottom up, and with this approach empowered older efforts at change and facilitated the emergence of powerful new grassroots voices. On February the 1st, 1960, black students in Greensboro, North Carolina launched sit-ins challenging segregation in restaurants and other public accommodations. Similar direct actions lit by this spark in Greensboro spread like wildfire across the South. SNCC was founded just two and a half months later on Easter weekend at an April meeting of sit-in leaders on the campus of Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ella Baker was the gathering's organizer. She immediately recognized the potential of this new student activism and persuaded Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to provide $800 to bring them together at her alma mater. I would be remiss not to materialize SNCC's deep international dimensions. As highlighted by Fanon Che Wilkins in his article, The Making of Black Internationalists, SNCC in Africa Before the Launching of Black Power, 1960-1965, at the founding of Conference of SNCC, at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, the delegates declared unequivocally, we identify ourselves with the African struggle as a concern for all mankind. To reinforce this claim, Antioch College undergraduate Alphonse Okuku from Kenya was a featured speaker at the conference. Okuku was invited to address the radical implications of the African struggle and to express words of solidarity with youth activists at the forefront of the student sit-in movement engulfing the U.S. South. Moreover, SNCC's founding advisor, Ella Baker, was heavily influenced by anti-colonialist movements throughout the African world. Miss Baker, as she was dutifully referred by her young peers, told biographer Joanne Grant she believed that the liberation movements in Africa and other parts of the world spurred on the U.S. civil rights movement. In the aftermath of the failure to implement the U.S. Supreme Court's 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision and the rising disillusionment over the ineffectiveness of the Civil Rights Act of 1957. To add more clarity, Ms. Baker organized a conference which led to the formation of SNCC just three weeks after the 1960 Sharpeville Massacre in South Africa. Movements on continental Africa itself can be found variously expressed in pre- and post-colonial Africa with their fullest articulation just before and during the various anti-colonialist movements. As many African liberation leaders had direct contact with students of African descent throughout the diaspora to include HBCUs. Least we forget the more recent fallist movements of which we have explored in other programs here on Africa World Now Project. I present this snapshot paying attention to historical continuity and Africana student resistance to simply provide an impetus to engage in more intentionally and consciously mapping of the range and scope of the black freedom movement. Today, we present a conversation with SNCC activist Cortland Cox. While a Howard University student, Cortland Cox became a member of the Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. He worked with SNCC in Mississippi and Lowndes County, Alabama, was the program secretary of SNCC in 1962, as well as the SNCC representative to the War Crimes Tribunal, organized by Bertram Russell. In 1963, he served as SNCC's representative on the steering committee for the March on Washington. In 1973, he served as the secretary general for the Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania. Additionally, he co-owned and managed the Drum and Spear Bookstore and Drum and Spear Press in Washington, D.C. In our conversation, we explored SNCC Freedom Schools, C.L.R. James, Jamil Alamin, Black internationalism, internal critical debate, scholars without portfolio, independent political parties, Seiko Torre, Tanzania, Marion Barry, and the Sixth Pan-African Congress. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program.
Thank you for joining us today, Courtland Cox. How are you? I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Wonderful. And and it is absolutely indeed up for you to join us on the programs today. And of course, this is on the eve of the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. Right. You know, as we begin to kind of unpack uh, your involvement and your work, your life's work, but also your involvement with SNCC, what does that mean to you? What does what does being on the eve on the March on Washington, what, do, what, what does that mean to you then, but also what does it mean to you now? Well, one of the things that's very interesting is I actually worked on the March on Washington. I was a SNCC representative to the March on Washington. And in fact, I was the one that convinced SNCC that they should join the March on Washington. So, um, so the March on Washington in 1963 plays a huge part in my life. Uh, in terms of you know what we went on, uh, it was there I met all the people that we know of, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, Roy Wilkins, and others. I think you know uh, this is we're now talking, doing a march on Washington, some what fifth almost sixty years later, fifty eight years later, and I think that the issue that they are trying to raise the vote, about the vote. And, and interestingly, John Lewis, and, and the name of the John Lewis Act, and John Lewis was literally the youngest speaker to speak at the March on Washington. And I think, as John said, the vote is the most important nonviolent instrument that we have. So it seems to me that where we have a situation where we're not only dealing with voter suppression in places like Texas and other places like that and Georgia, but more importantly, voter nullification in nine states where people feel that if the legislature doesn't like the way people vote in, in, in the state, they can change the vote. That is an important discussion. So I think what is happening now in terms of the March on Washington 58 years later is critical to the issue of democracy and whether in fact, particularly black people will be able to exercise their rights as citizens of the United States. Because the view is that, yeah, the view in some quarters is that the more black people vote, the less white people will have. And I think that is what's called the cultural war. And I think it's very important that we as citizens of the United States exercise every right that we have. And therefore the March on Washington 58 years later is very important. And so let's let's pull on this thread uh, because one of the interesting thing is, one of the interesting things is, is that I, I study uh, I and I don't like to say I study, but I really try to take lessons from, uh, you know, the wide range of black freedom movement in a global context uh, from a black internationalist perspective. And what is interesting is uh, and, I, and I like the way that you put, you know, you, you termed it in the context of, you know, the vote and we're marching. But a, a number in a number of other places, uh, you know, some folk might even argue, particularly in um, um, black organizing communities that organize from a radical perspective or from a, a non uh, a center, a non center perspective or, or liberal perspective. Uh, they might say that we're still marching for something that was already given to us. So why are we why are we marching? You know, and and, and for me, I'm not trying to say that marching is not important, but I just want to you know, and and the reason why I asked this, and I'm sorry, we, I just wanted to, I wanted to situate this and contextualize this, particularly in your work that you did on an independent black political party. Um, could you talk about you know this moment in the context of that? Yeah, I mean, my sense is. That, you know, I, I worked uh, in 1965 to create the Lowndes County Freedom Organization and Lowndes County Freedom Party. And the idea and the concept of it was that though is you should not only be exercising the vote, you should be holding political office and you should be exercising political power. So what we tried to do in 1965 is say to black, red, black people who could not vote 
and have not been registered to vote, you should not only just think about voting, you should think about being able to exercise power in terms of the use of those things that impact your life. And I think we got popular because we use the Black Panther as the, the symbol, which are not one is only not used in Alabama, but was used by the people in Oakland, California, the Black Panther Party and others. Now, I think that the discussion of presently about the vote is not about the vote itself. It's about the exercise of power. So what you see, the way it's come down is that the exercise of the vote was in 2020 and black people came out because they felt there was a threat to their existence. There was an existential threat. And then the people who, I mean, the people who we voted against saw that there was no way that they could win in the future because they got more votes than they ever had before and still lost by 7 million. So that in, in fact, the way the country is changing and the, the, the way that people of color becoming more and more important in the electoral process, what has happened is that they know that they cannot win by fear means and they need to control power. So they feel that they need to win by foul meals, foul means. Now, what is it important? Why is it important to us? It is important for us at a minimum level that the power of the state, especially when we're dealing with police and armed forces, not be in the control of those who pose an existential threat to us. At a minimum level, we do not want those people controlling the police and the armed forces because we see what they can do if they control it. Then at another level, we're talking about economic issues. Let's talk about when the COVID struck, who were considered essential workers and who were sent into factories to die. You know, that is a big issue. And then, you know, the issue of housing. As COVID struck, who are the people who are gonna be, you know, put on the streets? And why should we have governments that in fact have moratoriums and evictions? So my sense is the question of the vote is not about the vote itself at this point. It's about the power and who controls the state mechanisms, both in terms of budget resources and, 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 and armed forces, including the police. And therein lies a number of contradictions in the context of a systemic processes of, of, of what it means to vote in a, in a nation state where power is, has been traditionally in the hands of those power elite corporations, uh, people of European descent. And what this question leads me to and your answer leads me to is what are the most effective ways of organizing the Black working class communities today in the context of the vote power, but also the systemic processes. So it seems to me that while, yes, there is vote, there is power, the systemic processes of violence, the systemic processes of settler colonialism is what it seems to, to be the modus operandi of all these institutions. So how do we organize um, um, working class communities or what lessons, uh, because SNCC is one of the most well-documented uh, uh, organizations to be successful in organizing working class communities? Yeah, I think one of the things about we say in SNCC is what we did was not revolutionary. What we, who we did it for and who we did it with was revolutionary. So the discussion about who pays taxes, the question of who has enough food to eat, the question of what housing looks like, the question of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How do we now work? I mean, we have to have a mindset that not 
just the what we're trying to do is important, but who we're trying to do it with is, is, is equally as important because it's only when those people are in motion, then at the end of the day, you can have much change. So one of the things we, I have, we have a lot of SNCC people, SNCC veterans, as you know, most of them are over 70, 75, 80, but we're having a lot of conversations with today's activists from the Black Lives Matter, BYP 100, Dream Defenders, so forth and so on. And the important thing that we say to them is not what you want to say about the world, but who you involve in making sure that the world is better. And I think it's a very difficult discussion because now if we're gonna, most SNCC did most of its work in the rural areas of the country. And they did it in Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Southwest Georgia, so forth. Now we have to now expand the work into the cities. We have to expand the work throughout the country. And so my sense is the first thing that we have to get young activists today to understand, it is not what the revolutionary statement you make that's not going to be the important thing. The important thing is how you involve masses of people who are impacted by the negative realities of a capitalist system. How do you organize them to begin to deal with the issues that are most important to them, whether they're housing, food, whatever? And that's very interesting. Um, and, and I appreciate that answer because what you actually have you know, basically laid out uh, uh, is the difference between mobilization and organization, which right. is, which is, which is, it seems to seep through you as an organizer, right? So you are always thinking, you know, how do you organize coalitions and how do you organize, you know, masses of people? Um, I guess at this particular point, what will be interesting because one of the things that you you mention is, you know, what is revolutionary is who you do it with. Could you talk a little bit about? What brought you to SNCC? But also, was it something, was it, was it a similar sentiment uh, of those you were organizing with that brought them to SNCC um, in the context of trying to reorganize society to be more just, equitable, and, and fair? I could talk a little bit about your background, what brought you to SNCC, but also, you know, the and, and, who, and who you were doing things with. And, and we'll get, you know, further along. We'll unwrap that some more. All right, so I was 19 years old when I came to SNCC. I was a, I had to stay out a little while to work to get enough money to go to college. So I came to Howard University. And SNCC, I would say SNCC, you have to view SNCC in three parts. The first part was when after the sit-ins and we were just trying to knock down obstacles that were in our way, whether it is that you could not sit in the front of the bus, whether you could not sit on the lunch counter, whether you, I mean, things that de dealt with transportation, then think that public accommodations. And then what happened, I would say 1961, the NAACP World War II veterans, people like Amzie Moore and Mr. Steptoe in Mississippi came to SNCC who we, and I guess we were 20 years old and they said, look, if you really want to deal with issues that are important, you've got to start dealing with the vote. And Mississippi is the place because if you can do it in Mississippi, you can do it anywhere. And we, people like Bob Moses, who just passed this year, uh, maybe two months, a month ago, and Marion Barry, who was former mayor of Washington, D.C., and Reggie Robinson and others like that moved to Mississippi and spent the time to organize because it was very clear from Amzi Moore and everybody else who was in Mississippi, you do not come in Mississippi demonstrating. You have to have the time, the temperament to go talk to people, sit in their living rooms, eat what they eat, you know, listen to the things that they listen to, go to the juke joints, you know, just so that they trust you because at the end of the day, they were trusting you with their lives. 
it wasn't like, you know, if you if they went to vote, they were facing evictions from where they live, loss of job, and being shot. So it really was a very heavy lift. And you know, we're 19 and 20 years old, and we had to have the discipline and the, the sophistication to understand the environment. So that was, I would say, the second phase of SNCC. I would say working in Mississippi, working in Alabama, working in Southwest Georgia. I would say then the third phase of SNCC came, I would say in 1966, when Stokely started talking about black power and the need for us to rethink who we were and how we saw ourselves. So, I mean, in 1966, we were all Negroes. If you call somebody black, then you they wanted to fight because we were not black and we didn't lose anything in Africa. Now, today, if you call somebody a Negro, it's an insult. They wanted to be black, they want to be African American, and they want so my sense is there was a song, I think I'm not sure who made it, but say, check out your mind. I mean, because actually the whole sense of being able to decide and being able to act in a way that's really important really is the definitions from which you're operating, who you are, what in fact is, is important in life. So I think that's the thing that the third phase of SNCC brought. So I would say the first phase was knocking down barriers. The second phase was doing deep organizing to get the vote and dealing with political power. And the third phase dealt with black power. So my sense is that I think while SNCC really lasted about 10 years, I think that probably some of the most important people in terms of the kind of intensity that we went through, uh, you know, came out of that. I mean, just recently, I guess in the last year, two of the most prominent people died, John Lewis and, and, and Bob Moses. And, you know, before that, Julian Bond, I mean, but people, you know, when they look back on the work that we have done, I mean, they'll see that it's been consequential. No, thank you for that. And 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 we do have, I mean, H. Rot Brown. Uh, uh, Imam, oh, yeah, H. Rot Brown, who's, you know, who is now, in fact, actually, uh, I just talked to his uh, sister-in-law two days ago. Uh, he's in uh, uh, federal prison. He was in, he was in uh, maximum prison uh, in Supermax. And because of what SNCC did, and particularly Rev. Uh, Representative Benny Thompson, who now chairs the uh, the Homelands uh, Committee, he was. We are able to get him out of Supermax into a federal prison in Arizona. They're now trying to get him now into Georgia, where he's closer to his family. But one of the things, in terms of his, that I just heard from his sister-in-law, he just had cataract surgery because he couldn't see a lot. And he, you know, is very thankful that he he did get that surgery. But I'm also he wants to be out of prison at this point. But at least he is out of supermax, which is designed to break human beings. Yeah, and 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 it has done uh, 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 many breaking, uh, many things that is 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 attempted to break. You know, and particularly, and particularly people who of uh, African descent are, are folk who were in movements, uh, yeah. definitely. So, you know, and it's something that you said when you talked about. I, I, I want to do two. I want to see if I can merge two questions. Right. Um, and the first question is: How important is internal critical debate in organizations? And also. How important, oh, you've done a lot of work internationally and we're gonna to get to that. We definitely wanna to get to Africa, right? <laughs> we wanna do it right that way. But let's start here. How important is internal critical engagement, critical internal debate uh, in organization as people are trying to organize, particularly working class folk, but also in an international context? Right, it's extremely important. And here's, here's what I think. 
I think the two most critical things in any organization before you begin work is the what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. If everybody's on the same page about what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it, then you can be highly successful because the questions of how you do it and when you do it and how much it costs and all those things are secondary to the question of what it is you're trying to do and why it is you're trying to deal with it. So therefore, the most important thing is be able to define very clearly what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it in any organization. Because if you don't get those two correct, there's nothing you can do that will allow you to be successful. If you were to say, um, and this this is probably like an open-ended, very, you know, I don't think that there's probably really a specific answer to this question. Um, but if you were to say um, the predominant ideological propensity of SNCC, or what would you say that that would you say what would you say led SNCC's work at a at a at a at a base level as far as ideology as far as philosoph uh, philosophically, uh, politically, theoretically? Yeah, I think one of the things I think that allowed SNCC to be successful is that the driving force was what are the needs of the local community what do they want why do they want it and how do we allow them how do we work with them to take leadership on the issues to allow them to deal with the issues because snick snick viewed itself as an organization of organizers so our responsibility was not to build snick the organization our responsibility was to build other organizations that you know allowed people who were suffering issues particularly at the local level and at the bottom of the socioeconomic level to achieve power that was the mindset that it wasn't about us it was about the communities we worked in and it was very important because i mean for very practical reasons right so snick veterans snick workers in 1960 we got paid ten dollars a week nine dollars and 64 cents after taxes most of the times we did not get that money so we had to in order to eat in order to do a number of things we had to depend on the communities we lived in the communities we lived in would support us if they thought we brought value to those communities so it was very clear on a, a very basic and an important level that we understood that we valued the communities we worked in and it was their responsibility to take leadership it was their responsibility to make the decisions that allowed them to deal with the issues that they wanted to deal with it wasn't us it was them and it's very interesting that you say that because you talk about the communities that you that you worked in and you talk about this notion of a collectivity which those of us who understand that that traces back to what was brought from the continent of Africa, that ethos, that collective community ethos, uh, each one taking care of each one. Um, and if there's trouble, if there's conflict, then we work those particular problems out. Which brings me to my question, how important was Africa in your work and your turn to organizing uh, the six pack in 1974? Oh, it was very important. Uh, you know, as we did the work in the South, I mean, and, and I would say both Kwame Toure, my good friend Stokely Carmichael, who I grew up with, I mean, so, I mean, you know, it was very important to us because we understood that the at some point in the early 60s, maybe mid 60s, not early 60s, but mid 60s, that if we did not include Africa in our discussions, we would not be able to, to deal with our situation here. I mean, at every level, it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about economic, we're talking about psychologically, we're talking about culturally, we're talking about politically. It, it was important for us to 
relate to Africa because we could not see ourselves as isolated subjects who were just started with slavery. We had a history because one of the things that was important, I mean, when I came out of the South uh, in 1967, 1968, um, we started Drum and Spear Bookstore in Washington, DC. And the reason we started Drum and Spear Bookstore, they're mostly SNCC veterans, we, and the Drum and Spear Press was because across the land, it was believed that black people had no culture contributed nothing to society. And one of the things we wanted to do was in a very physical way, bring all of the things that existed in the East African publishing press, you know, in, in, in a Présence Africaine, in all these things into one place so black people could see that there were books, there were literature, you know, the nine books of, of W.B. Du Bois and the three autobiographies, you know, there's the stuff with Sterling Brown, the stuff with Langston Hughes, James Baldwin. I mean, we just could go on and on, but people were told a lie that there was nothing. And because we could bring in the African presence, because we could bring in the Caribbean presence, because C.L.R. James played a very important role in our lives, because we could bring those things in, then we could show people that, you know, there was a lie being told and you should see the world differently. Now, so I went to Africa, I started going to Africa in 1970 and in fact, got married in Africa. I was married in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania to my wife who was, who was uh, African-American. But I was, we had decided that we would go there. I mean, a number of us went there and particularly Tanzania because Tanzania with Julius Nerere was a place where the kind of mindset that we had in SNCC in terms of the value of the people was very important. In fact, I and mean, it's very interesting, I got married in 1970 in Tanzania. So that's 51 years ago, right? And it was, I mean, it was, Dar es Salaam was a quiet place. I mean, like really, I mean, really quiet. My wife and I went back to Tanzania about a year, two years ago. It is huge. I mean, huge. I mean, and, and one of the things I learned that Tanzania was the fifth, has the fifth largest population in Africa. It has a bigger population in South Africa. But the thing that was important to me about being in Tanzania at that time, we met up with people like Walter Bagoya uh, and, and others who were our age, who we could, we would sit up till two, three, four in the morning talking about the world. And so what we were able to do is that we had our own experiences here in the United States, but given, you know, uh, what was going on in Africa, because you have to realize is at that point that Tanzania was the center of, for the liberation movements. And so all the discussion about liberation from Angola, from Mozambique, from South Africa, from Namibia, all those places were coming through that central place. And then you had all these young people who were part of TANU, who were part of the Tanzanian talking and seeing. And, and so we had a mix of, I mean, we were very fortunate. We were able to talk. I mean, we were in our twenties and thirties so we could stay up all night and talk and argue and, and see the world. I mean, it was very, very important to the way that we were educated, not in any formal sense, but the most fundamental sense where we could understand the what's and the why's that we were trying to think about across the land, both in Africa and the United States. And the other thing I would say is there was a Caribbean uh, component. Uh, AUC Kwayana, who was in Guyana, and New Jewel Movement, who was in Trinidad, and, and you know Walter Rodney, who was from, from, uh, from Guyana, but was in Tanzania. I mean, so you had really at that point a great fertilization of people and ideas. So you had the Caribbean, you had Africa, you had the United States, 
And so, I mean, our sense of the world really came from that kind of perspective. So uh, my being married in Tanzania wasn't a big deal. I learned to drive a car in Tanzania, you know? I mean, a stick shift. I mean, so it was like I was home. I was doing, I mean, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't any formal thing. It was just a place that I could have been in California or, or, or New York. I mean, being in Tanzania or being in Africa. The other thing I'd say finally is in my organizing the Six Pan African Congress, I uh, had to travel around the world. Uh, and so I would, I went to the OAU to, to talk about the, uh, and I was traveling, fortunately I was traveling to with CLR James at that time. And I, I was invited by Sekuture to come to Guinea to talk about the Six Pan African Congress. And I was fortunate enough, he invited me to his home to have, to have lunch and to talk about it. So my, my sense is, you know, and we're now talking, I'm like 32 years old, you know, I mean, so you also have to picture, I mean, I'm doing all this stuff in my 20s and my 30s, and I, I have the arrogance enough to think that I just should fit in. But I mean, I just think that, I mean, I just have to say, as I sit here being 80 years old, that I was very fortunate in my life. And I went to a period where, I mean, there was a great deal of cross fertilization of thought within the African community. No, that that was great. Um, could, you could you talk a little bit more about the importance of six pack? Could you talk a little bit more about the work that went into organizing that? Uh, and, I, and, I, and I understand that uh, uh, CLR James was very important in that particular uh, yes. organizing that as well. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, well, first of all, CLR was not only very, he was the one that wrote the call. So the call to the Six Pan African Congress was written by CLR James. First, uh, let me just kind of spill, stay on CLR James for a minute. CLR James was respected highly because he was both an intellectual, but also a big supporter of the African liberation movements and particularly when I say African liberation movements, I'm not talking about Kenya, Tanzania, I'm talking about what happened was going on in 1945, because he was a key opponent of the 1945 Fifth Pan African Congress. What was very important to me, and I would travel to see with CLR, I traveled to CLR James to, to meet with, with uh, President Nereri in Tanzania. Uh, and the respect that he got was incredible. I went to, uh, um, I went up to um, Canada, to, to the capital Canada, uh, name escapes me right now, uh, to, to talk to the prime minister of Jamaica. I went, to, I mean, wherever CLR went, as a person who did not hold any big political office, the respect that he had from leaders of the African and Caribbean states was really incredible. Now, I think that for the six Pan-African Congress, they would, I would say two big things that were, well, three big things. The first I would say is that there was a collective discussion uh, in, and we're talking 1974, there was a collective discussion from Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, and and United States about the the African community, so that there wasn't that. Well, you know, because when I was coming up, as I said earlier, people would say, "Well, I didn't lose anything in Africa," but people now felt the intellectuals like, you know, uh, I guess Amira Baraka at that point he was Leroy Jones. Um, in fact, there are people, I mean, the thing that surprised me actually is who really was there um, because there were people who came to be professors at Harvard, law professors at Harvard, and really people who were at all walks of life uh, were particularly 
at this conference. I mean, and and you know, I, I do think we had a huge contingent uh, from the United States, and that was because of the big work from Sylvia Hill, uh, who understood. But then we also had, you know, I mean, most of my work was in Africa. I was working with Jerry Augusto and and Kathleen Flewellen and a couple other people. The Tanzanian government gave us a bunch of things, including an office, uh, you know, housing and all that kind of stuff. But I would say to you, so the first thing that came out of the conference was a sense of community. The second thing I would say that came out of the conference was the support for the liberation movements. Because, I mean, it was now imperative because as you know, after that time, you know, the United States, I mean, African Americans led the charge to just bang on the United States until they began to deal with this issue of South Africa, and Southern Africa. And finally, I would say we tried to do is that we said that African Americans had technical skills in terms of engineering, in terms of other fields that, that exist. And how would we bring, you know, those skills to the use on the African continent? So, I mean, that was part of what happened. It didn't, it wasn't a mass effort, but there were efforts to do it. So I would say collectively, I mean, in terms of six pack one, a sense of community and a sense of Africanness wherever we live. Two, a sense of ending colonialism and apartheid in Southern Africa. And three, the whole discussion of the use of technical skills in terms of the development of Africa. And you know, what's interesting here, and I wanna, for our listeners, um, is, to, is to connect some dots here, because there was a few things that you said that I wanted to kind of highlight. Okay. You talked about the, the the drum and spear, going back to your to your previous right. answer, you talked about the drum and spear bookstore and 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 collecting um, um, knowledge and building a knowledge base that was counter to the dominant narrative of Africa uh, being less than or uncivilized. And I'm linking this to Arturo Schomburg, right? Building the Schomburg right. Center, right? And something that you said in the in your comment, you talked about this notion of informal education. Right. And this right. is very important because, you know, Antonio Gramsci has a notion of organic intellectuals when he talks about that we all are intellectuals and we 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 develop at a an intellectual base based upon the process us understanding the conditions within which we live and also at the same time attempting to change those things that becomes very important and of course clr james you have a, a, a stalwart figure that is a connecting figure right and also taking an interest in young folk just like Ella Baker took an interest in you guys, right? Yeah. So could you talk a little bit, you know, about um, what was SNCC look like today? Well, let me let me talk about informal education. For okay, sure, time. sure. Because sure, I sure. think I'm, I'm really, I, I think that's a very, very important point. And I want to talk about my, inform, I mean, how I was informally educated. So I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Harlem, right? And informal education started when I would go on 125th Street and 7th Avenue. And on the four corners, somebody was on a ladder, you know, talking about Africa, talking about issues and so forth. And I would sit there, I mean, I'd stand there in the street and go from corner to corner to listen to what they had to say. So, I mean, so that was an education that, I mean, you know, was there because people didn't have a way of telling, you know, their stories and so forth. And I, so I go for that and I'm mean, very fortunate that, but I was almost so very privileged besides Ella Baker and CLR James, another important person in my, in our lives. And I'm talking about our lives. I'm talking about SNCC. I'm talking about Stokely, Ed Brown, Rap Brown. I'm talking about all the people we know was Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown, was a professor at uh, Howard University. And Stanley Brown did two or three things. First, he was an, I mean, he knew black poetry, 
he was a poet and he wrote strong men and joe meek and all that he was a person who knew the blues and he was a person who knew jazz and he would come to our dormitory at our invitation and he would in fact be able to to go through and we could go through a session on poetry he could go through a session on jazz he could go to a session on blues i mean he had all of it and in addition to that i mean he really made us he would invite us to his house and we would sit and sip liquor and he would talk about the people he knew including the boys and other people and the, you know, their mannerisms and so forth. So Du Bois came alive. It wasn't souls of black folk. It wasn't all the stuff that he wrote. It was, you know, his wearing spats and his doing. I mean, so I mean that is another thing about informal education that we, you know we were very privileged to have. So my my sense is that you know we were we were very. And then the other thing that for me anyhow is that the meetings that we had in the south you know people who were sharecroppers and you know and so forth you know would get up and talk and the people in the south really they 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 get to the point and they they sum it up and i remember a woman in uh in mississippi she got up at a mass meeting and she said you know us colored people been using our mouths to do two things, to eat and say yasa. It's time we said no. I mean, within that statement, she said, we must resist, we must fight. It wasn't all this into, I mean, she was to the point. You know, my, my sense is, I mean, and to do it, I mean, and the other thing that I, you know, in terms of the informal thing, I remember uh going into Lowndes County Alabama and you know they they Mr. Jackson and he gives us he allows us to stay at his house but I mean not his house a house that he owns right next to his house but he stays up all night to protect us against violence and you see in this man who probably didn't have a fourth grade education the kind of strength that a nation could be built on in terms of his view of the world, his sense of, of who he was, his sense of, I mean, and there were just several of those people. So I'm just saying, you know, that we were very fortunate because we allowed ourselves to be engaged and engaged with people who were important, whether it was Sterling Brown, whether it was the sharecropper, whether it was the street guy in the street corner in Harlem, that in information and intelligence and things that make you smarter exist everywhere. They just don't exist in a certain place and a certain kind of people. You've got to respect everybody. So and with that respect, you're able to learn and become smarter. And I'm glad you, did, you, you, you honed in on that point because this led to freedom schools. Am I correct? Right, right. I mean, so the freedom schools, I mean, it's just just thinking about the freedom schools. So in 1964, you know, and again, I mean, my sense is, and I, I keep trying to, it blows, the thing that blows my mind, in 1964, I was 23 years old. Charlie Cobb, the person who had the idea for the freedom schools was probably 19 or 20 years old. I mean, so we, I mean, we are bold enough to think that you know we, we, we can make things happen that make of consequence. And what was interesting, we thought of the freedom schools as geared to the kids. And that was important. But what happened was the adults also came to the freedom schools and they said, I want to learn not only to vote, but I want to learn to read and write. So the freedom schools, while the characterization of the freedom schools were for the young people, 50% of the freedom schools were for adults who wanted adult literacy classes in order for them now to better their own lives. So my sense is that, I mean, every time I think about it, you and we were 20, 21, 22, 
23, I'm probably on the upper scale at being at 23. Bob Moses was so far out, he was like 28 years old, you know, you know, and Jim Foreman was like 30. So, I mean, but I'm just saying, I mean, when I think back, the thing that's most amazing to me, as I think about what we did and so forth, because I was saying, I think the thing that was most important to us was our determination. We were prepared not to let any circumstances, no matter how high or how dastardly, stop us. We were determined that we understood the what and what we understood the why, and we were not going to allow anything to, to, to stop us. The second thing is that we had a tradition, particularly I would say about Jim Foreman. Jim Foreman, you came to Jim Foreman, I would say, and you said, Jim, I have an idea. I think this is really good. And he would say, yes, that is really good. Why don't you go do it? I mean, the example was, I came, SNCC was not going to join the March on Washington because they were doing all the work in the South and really doing it. I came to Jim Foreman. I said, Jim, this is really important. We got to do this. And Jim said, you go do it. You uh, now go connect to the March on Washington. You represent SNCC. So my sense is we gave ourselves permission, whether it was the Freedom Schools, whether it was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic, what, Lounge County Freedom, or whatever, music, the Freedom Singers. We gave ourselves permission to do what was necessary because we understood first the what and the why. And then all the questions about how we got there, whether the freedom schools or political parties or this or that, we gave ourselves permission to do it. I would also add to that, that you guys had an imagination. You guys had a <laughs> radical imagination. To, <laughs> well, to, we to, were 20, look, look, we were, again, we were in our twenties. We didn't have all this stuff. I mean, you remember, remember, and I, I mean, you're not probably old enough to re remember this, but when we started out, this whole thing about McCarthyism was still there. And so, you know, and so the thing that they try to brand us was we were communists. And, you know, and Martin King, I mean, the older gentleman, they tried to communist, they try to beat you down with that. And, you know, what God, I mean, was interesting. I went, I was in Mississippi once, in particular in the early 60s. And a lady came up to me and she said, I'm sure glad you communists are here to help us. So she said, okay, you're communists. I don't really care. You're here to help us. That, so, I mean, we, I mean, it was like totally irrelevant. And so my sense is that, you know, being young, we were creative. And I would say we were creative and it allowed us to be smart. I mean, it allowed I me, mean, I think, you know, when I think about the people who, and, and it's interesting, we're now organizing the SNCC 60th anniversary conference. And most of the work is being done by volunteers. And all the volunteers are SNCC veterans. I mean, you know, I mean, basically, we were together for 10 years in, in such intense situations that 50, 60 years later, we still know each other. We still work together. We still do a bunch of things that make a difference in, in the lives that we see. So, I mean, I'm just saying not only we were determined, but I think the, the, the searing experience allowed us to function in, in, in doing things, no matter what we did, whether it was in education, you know, whether it was in government, you know, whether it was in other areas, we still understand the what and the why. And we did, we were doing a hundred different hows to get there, but we still understood the what and the why. No, that, that's important. And, 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 and as someone who is uh, attempts to kind of disrupt, you know, this notion of formal and informal education, as I mentioned before, I would, I would, I would say it was more non-institutional in the context of, and also we got to be clear about when you go back to Harlem and you talk about those, any one of those lecturers on that corner could have been in any classroom at the time. Oh yeah. But, oh, yeah. 
you know, they were in that classroom. Yeah. As far as they're concerned, they were in the classroom. You know, I mean, my sense is you're right. You make a very important point. We, we have, to, especially dealing with the academy, you know, who is where, I mean, the academy tends to be extractive. They take, the, the the ideas and the views of people and then they try to make them their own and put jargon around them so that people don't even recognize the ideas that have been stolen we now have to fight to make sure that all of us understand that that we are the academy in terms of our lives we are the ones who are bringing ideas it's not somebody who read a book, it's somebody who's lived a life. And that is the important thing. And, and that's the fight we have to make. One of the things that I, that I uh, uh, do in my work, uh, specifically in, in, in critiquing uh, the theory and practice of human rights, uh, using what we consider to be the different manifestations of the Black freedom movement, is the is is pull on this notion of a critical consciousness, meaning that it's not enough to be aware of the conditions of oppression, but it's also it's important for us to also do something about it. And the artic you guys are that that shining example of that that shining example of a critical consciousness. Yeah, you know, I think that's probably the thing that aggravates me today, right? Uh, I talk to my friends, I mean, you know, and, you know, I've been kind of, I mean, I'm, you know, I talk to people I know today and they want to sit around and complain about who's doing what and what's being done and so forth. And then I want to ask them, what is it you want to do? And I'm not talking about my SNCC, my SNCC people. I'm talking about the guys, you know, I, 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 I play golf with or just have a meal with and stuff. And they, they like to talk about the problem. They like to celebrate the problem. Uh, and, but the act of trying to do something about it, it really, they, 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 they had a sense of what can we do? And I'm saying you can take an act. Uh, and, you know, I do think on the opposite side of it, is with SNCC, what I learned in SNCC is that you, do, even in the most difficult circumstances, when I say difficult, physical violence, you did not allow it to paralyze you. You know, you, you were conscious of what could happen to you. You were conscious of the circumstances. You were conscious of what's going on, but you didn't allow it to paralyze you. I mean, on the other side, and what you find a lot is that there is a sense that this is happening to me. I'm a victim and I can't really do much about it. And I, that's to me the most aggravating thing at this point in my life. You know, I, that's why I really find it very good to keep in touch with my SNCC friends because they always want to talk about not only what the problem is, but what are we prepared to do? Still talking about that. And as you say, you uh, you guys were in the in in, in situations uh, that, but but you know, oftentimes you know we we those who study or have a historical consciousness, we, we often talk about the period as being like, oh, that was history. But a lot of those particular things are happening right now. So understanding the, the, the continuities, not only in oppression, but continuities in resistance is just as important. And I think that that's probably what you're talking about. It's one thing to just describe the problem, right? Yes, this happened here. This is the continuity, or as you said, very, very eloquently celebrate the problem, you know, but it's also important to figure out, use our radical imaginations to figure out because we also have the continuities and resistance. Uh, that's important to understand. Yeah, I As, mean, I, I think, I think I'm, I know that I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna talk about this probably at the conference. So I know we're probably in terms of power, you know, holding political office, having financial resources and so forth in the best position 
that we have been in as a community, African-American community. But we, I'm gonna say the next statement is that we have a lot of people to thank. And we have to thank the, the brothers and sisters who rose, we have to thank Harriet Tubman. We have to thank Nat Turner. We have to fight, fight the black people uh, who fought in the Civil War. You know, we also have to thank Frederick Douglass. We have to thank even Booker Washington and W.B. Du Bois and Monroe Trotter and, and the NAACP and all these, because we did not get here. You know, Thurgood, Mar what gave us permission to act was what Thurgood Marshall did with Brown v. Board of Education. So we have, a given where we are today, we have a lot of people to thank. But even more important, the question now becomes, now, I mean, that's that, I don't remember that song, the third world song, now that we've found love, what are we gonna do with it? You know, the question is now that we have found, you know, some power, what are we gonna do with it? In these cities, we control budgets. You know, how are the money gonna be expended to make the life of people better? You know, in these cities, we control the police force. You know, how do we make their mission different? You know, in, the, in the, these cities, we control budgets that deal with housing. How do we make house, affordable housing a reality? How do we not get overwhelmed with gentrification? How do we not just buy into, we should, you know, allow tax breaks for the rich because it benefits everybody to try that. So my sense is, you know, now we have some power. What are we prepared to do with it? I mean, I worked in an administration with Marion Barry. And Marion was able to really involve a lot of people. I mean, right now today, I mean, you talk about the youth and the senior citizens and so forth. And one of the things that really ticked the, the business community off, and that's the reason why they came at him, and they come at you hard. Marion Barry said that 25% of all equity participation in downtown development had to go to the black community. And they said, now you in our pockets, now we're gonna have to deal with you. So they now got the newspaper, the Washington Post, who started saying that he was a thief. They had the Geneva, who's on how you can find on Fox 5, who a big supporter of Trump, who was the, the, the federal prosecutor at that point, started coming after Marion. Fortunately, Marion didn't care about money. He did not care about money. So they could never get him on anything like that. So my sense was that we, as we begin to try to exercise power, we have not seen the way they're gonna come after you. Cause this is really, uh, I mean, one of the things, one of the things I tell my friends, the Democrats keep talking about right and wrong. The Republicans keep talking about win and lose. They don't care about right and wrong. They care about winning and losing. And therefore, you know, if we're gonna understand what game we're in, we're not, we have to engage in right and wrong because that's the base principle. But we also have to understand that as we try to exercise power, whether it's, you know, on the local level in terms of, you know, who gets food stamps, whether it's on you know, the state level or the federal level about Medicare for all, whether it's uh, the question of whether people get evicted from housing. There is a group of people who, what you see as a problem, what you see as a problem, they see as a solution. They see it as a solution. So, I mean, Jim Crow to some people was a, for us was a problem. To them, it was a solution. The exploitation, economic exploitation, we see as a problem, they see as a solution. Slavery to us was a problem. To them, it was a solution. So we have to, un I mean, and the things that we see as solutions, that is to say, taxing people 
who you know pay no taxes we see that as a solution they see that as a problem so we have to understand that everybody doesn't see the world as we see it they have to understand at the end of the day that there is a community of interest and that community of interest has to act and not be paralyzed has to not complain it has to act and also know the other side is coming at them because every you cannot believe and I, it's hard for people and i say this it's really hard for people to understand that what you see as a problem others see as a solution people tend to think that everybody tends to be like them that's not the case so i mean as we begin at this point to try to exercise power the level of sophistication we have to have is a lot bigger than what we had in the 60s no that's very very interesting um and 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 my goodness like six questions popped in my head but i don't want to keep you <laughs> keep you any longer um uh and and i i do hope that i, I can connect with you uh, okay. a, a little bit more but as we kind of wrap up um what do you what do you what was what is your sense that SNCC was evolving to? What was your sense that SNCC would look like uh, today in the context of this particular period? That's, I know this is an open-ended question and there's no right or wrong, but. I, I, think, I think that the SNCC would look like today, I think probably is, is in the middle part of what I described to you, that the question of working with the communities and organizing the communities particularly urban communities and beginning to use whatever political power and political offices to try to use those budgets and resources to make people's lives better. I mean, I think I would say if you look at what Marion did in the years, I mean, it's interesting. So Marion served three terms. And then they got him on the, the this whole thing at the Vista Hotel, right? And they put him in jail. And Marion was elected after that because people understood his value. So my sense is the question is for that SNCC would have to deal with and other people would have to deal with is what do you do with power and resources to make the lives of people better today? you have budgets i mean the united the district of columbia has a 17 billion dollar budget where the resources are spent you know do we spend the resources in developing schools for ward three and ward four and so forth or do we spend it on education in ward seven and eight you know you know how do we deal with affordable housing how do we deal with people having enough to eat I mean, how do we deal with all of those things? So we now have to deal with, with the our communities as if we were the people who were responsible for those communities in the sense of you know, the resources that it takes. So I would think if I were looking at anything, I would look at what Barry did in terms, I mean, he did a number of things like for example, he, he made, he opened up the racial thing. And that, you know, I think some of that is done. What we have to deal with is the economic piece. I mean, and that is what's gonna be crucial. Uh, how do we begin to deal with the economic piece? And and what about, what about, you know, because I see the, you know, I saw under, again, understanding a lot of SNCC veterans and a lot of uh, folk who were involved in SNCC kind of, you know, moved into an international, Realm. What about that particular component? What, what would there be a robust uh, foreign oh, yeah. affairs, robust international? Yeah, I mean, my sense you would have to be because if you're going to deal with the issues of health, right? It has to have an international perspective. If you're going to deal with the issue on economic issues and and trade and so forth, it's got to have an economic perspective. Because my sense is that, you know, the, 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 I mean, I, I, I will tell you, I was traveling in Africa two, I say two years ago, and I was amazed at the economic energy that existed. I mean, I mean, 
everybody was selling something everybody was engaged i mean and they were i mean there were so many people and so many things that didn't exist before and the level of energy in africa was just incredible and my sense is that as that goes on i mean they're going to help to define the world and the relationships and one of the things that is very clear is and i hate it the the old colonial mentality which we see unraveling in afghanistan and unravel in vietnam and other places like that cannot be the foreign policy of the united states we have to now be major players in that and we have to not engage in wars and not engage in exploitative relationships we now have because we as africa and asia get strong i mean i will tell you even more phenomenal than africa i went to china in 1985 and there were no private cars i mean you i mean it was rural i mean burning coal you know everybody was on a bicycle i went to china maybe four or five years ago i mean you would not believe the change I mean, and that's happening, gonna happen in Africa, it's gonna happen everywhere else. And people, I mean, so the relationships are gonna be much more even, and the United States are gonna have to accommodate itself, and all the people in the United States that have to accommodate themselves, that they can't have 6% of the world's population and 33% of the world's wealth. They have to, they have to now understand that they, they, we have to have a much more even balance and our relationship with Africa is going to be a big deal in that response. God. Thank you for sharing that. And of course, I do not want to end this conversation uh, without you talking a little bit about uh, the conference or the, the, the commemoration that you were mentioning. Yes. yes. So the SNCC 60, 60th anniversary will take place on October 14th through 16th. And, you know, we have a, one of the things we're gonna talk about a number of things that we talked about. We have uh, a, a person who, Hakeem Jeffries, who is at the uh, University of uh, Ohio State, the Ohio State, <laughs> uh, and he's gonna help put deal a number of, put some things in context in terms of how we got here. We got people like Charlie Cobb who started the Freedom Schools. We have Deatra Jackson, the leader of BYP 100, we have people from Mississippi talking about this. We have an interview with Keith Ellison, who in Minnesota got this guy, you know, and we have, we want to talk about the criminal justice system, not to moan about what happened and so forth, but to say, if you are now in power, how should you act in terms of criminal justice system? And so he's going to be interviewed by James Foreman Jr., who is former executive secretary, of of SNCC, but who's not his he's now a professor a law professor at yale and they're going to be talking about how you exercise power we're also going to be talking again uh we had shirley sherrod who used to work at the agriculture department and we want to talk about what we should be doing about food and things like that because i mean at, at, in a nutshell we want to say to to young people and this is going to be a multi-generational conference so basically we have all the leaders many of the leaders who came after trevon martin as speakers and panelists and moderators at this conference uh, along with SNCC veterans and we want to say given where we are what should we be doing given where we are how do what are examples we need to look at that will allow us to take it to the next level. So we're not just, we don't wanna hear complaints. We, will, we don't wanna hear the white man is bad. We know that, that we, so that, that is all hat. What we wanna talk about is what we're gonna do. And so we have a number of people, you know, from Derek Johnson from the NAACP, Imani Perry from Princeton, you know, uh, you know people, uh, we, we, uh, Rachel Gilmer from the Dream Defenders. Uh, I mean, people, I mean, I would say we have people, I would say from 25 to 80 something involved in this. This is a multi-generational conference. 
And, and also, I would also say, uh, the last thing I'll say is that Questlove gave us permission to show Summer of Soul as part of the conference. So all the people who missed it in the theaters, you know, it will be, it will be part of, it'll be shown, I think, over two nights at, uh, at, at the conference. Thank you. This is, you know, as we talked a little bit off, offline before this, um, you know, we have, I have worked around and with some of the people that you have, you, right. you, are, you are close friends with. And I do have the, you know, this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to, to, to actually talk face to face. Well, well, video chat. And I definitely, definitely look forward to spending some more time with you. Um, and also, again, I am a, a, a solution oriented person as well. Uh, it is one thing to just talk about issues. But again, it's another thing to really organize people on a global level, because those are the, some of the things that I am involved in. Again, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I hope this conversation was as beneficial for you as it was for me and for our listeners. Hope. That's it for Africa Woke Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email Project at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa Woke Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Moisa Muntali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Una Ngonda, senior research, content contributor, and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior research, content contributor, and production associate, Dr. Josh Myers, Associate Producer and Content Contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry. Content Contributor and Filmmaker, Kurt Orderson. Technology Advisor, it's Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies. And Creative Directors, International Creative and Artist Designer, Tabasim Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR Affiliate and Broadcast Service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. <laughs>